the image on the shroud is it of a is it of a resurrected man or a dead man because if you're if you're looking at like what are we looking at really when we is it is it like you know with the blood samples and are the blood stains what are we looking at really well we're looking at a man who is certainly scourged beaten speared crucified crowned with a cap of thorns if you will uh, which matched the gospel accounts of what was done to jesus um so one can infer from that and the accumulation of all the data. Look, I don't have a problem accepting that this is the cloth that wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth. People say, well, then you've got to become a Christian. I go, wait a minute. Those are two separate issues. A Jewish burial shroud of a Jewish man who I believe existed, as most people do. Um, and we have a documented piece of cloth that wrapped his body after his death. I don't have a problem accepting that without necessarily having to accept that he was or was not the Messiah. Now, people, I get evangelized all the time, and I would say, well, look, I'm not excluding a possibility that he was the Messiah. Okay, guys, uh, welcome, welcome to this podcast. I'm here with a very special gentleman tonight, and his name is Barry Schwartz. Now, Barry was the official documenting photographer for the Shroud of Turin Research Project, STIRP, the team that conducted the first in-depth scientific examination of the Shroud in 1978. Today, he plays an influential role in Shroud research and education as the editor and founder of the internationally recognized Shroud of Turin website, the oldest, largest, and most extensive Shroud resource on the internet with more than 15 million visitors from over 160 countries. In 2009, he founded the Shroud of Turin Education and Research Association, Inc., Stera Inc., a nonprofit corporation to which he donated the website and, its, and, its, and his extensive Shroud photo, photographic collection, as well as many other important Shroud resources in order to preserve and maintain these materials and make them available for future research and study. He currently serves as the president of Stura Inc. So welcome, Barry, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. I've listened to a lot of your um, interviews and down throughout the years, and you're going to be talking tonight about a medical and scientific mystery about the negative image of a man on a cloth, the Shroud of Turin. So can you please tell us what is the Shroud of Turin? Well, sure. And first, thank you for inviting me onto your show. Um, this is the first time I've been on a, a English speaking program being recorded for Spain. <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll speak slowly enough that people will be able to at least understand what I have to say. So, uh, my involvement uh, with the Shroud started basically uh, because I was a professional photographer that worked primarily in science and medicine, technology. I did uh, commercial work as well, uh, working with graphic designers and advertising agencies. But the bulk of my work was for aerospace and medical device companies, hospitals, uh, and many others in the medical field. So I had the opportunity basically to work on projects, uh, like I said, some were aerospace. And I was uh, commissioned, if you will, to work on a project for Los Alamos National Laboratories. Now they're probably best known for inventing the atomic bomb. And I have to admit that the seven month project I did for Los Alamos was about atomic bombs. It was about the mushroom clouds and their computers back. This was in 1975. Uh, the computers that NASA had uh, or the Jep, uh, that uh, Los Alamos had were able to extract new information from above ground uh, motion pictures of the atomic bomb blast, the mushroom cloud. And so for seven months, I served as a photographic consultant on that project, working with another gentleman named Don Devan. And at the end of the project we finished, and just a few weeks after that, uh, I was called again by Don Devan. And I, you know, when you're self-employed and the phone rings, you're praying that's the next job. 
So when Don called me the second time, I was excited and I thought, aha, something, you know, another project. And he said, well, not, not exactly. He said, uh, Barry, wh what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I laughed. I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and Don laughed and he said, so am I, remember? He was one of the other Jewish members that wound up on, a, on the STIRP team. And he explained to me that they'd taken an image of the Shroud and put it into a, a, an imaging device that was being used over at Sandia Labs, a sister laboratory to Los Alamos, also a weapons explosives laboratory. And uh, the gentleman over there was using this device, this VP8 image analyzer, as a means of, he was an x-radiographer. That's what his work was, uh, x-rays. So he wanted to see if he could get more data from his x-rays. So he got this VP8. You take a black and white camera and input the image to the VP8. It outputs the display on a green screen. And then it takes the lights and darks of the image and stretches them into 3D vertical space proportionate to each other. So he explained to me that when they do that with a normal photograph, you get a jumbled, distorted mass of information. But when they did it with an image of the shroud, it yielded the natural relief of a human form. As a professional photographer, I realized immediately, I cannot encode distance information in my two-dimensional photograph. I can imply distance using highlighting and shadowing, but I'm not really capturing any distance information in my image. The, the image on the shroud captured distance information, and we were able to determine ultimately that where the direct contact was made between cloth and body, the image is darkest. And as the distance increased up to about three and a half to four centimeters, the image grows more faint until it reaches extinction at about four centimeters. That implied to me immediately that there had to be some correlation and that this body that wrapped that was wrapped in this cloth, there was some correlation between this body. And that showed me that the image on this cloth couldn't have been an artwork because we can't encode that kind of information into our photographs or artworks. And so that caught my interest. Uh, but I was also feeling uncomfortable about getting involved in something that was religious and beyond my expertise and scope. And I didn't feel appropriate to jump into something that I knew very little about at the time. I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home. But uh, I also thought about a free trip to Italy. <laughs> I'd never been to Europe. And so that helped make that decision. But I was really fascinated by that image property. And that's what led to my joining the team ultimately. And mm. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, you did. When, uh, for example, well, when was it first mentioned the shroud? When, did, when was it? When did it first get mentioned anywhere? Well, the, yeah, okay, it, that that was a question I didn't answer. What is the shroud? The shroud is a fourteen and a half foot long, and I'm sorry, I have to do it in uh, uh, U.S. Uh, terms rather than the rest of the world being on metric. I, I always tell everybody the U.S. went on the metric system about 50 years ago, and at least seven Americans have now learned the metric system. <laughs> so, uh, so the shroud is 14 and a half feet by about three and a half feet long. It bears the image of a crucified, scourged, speared, crowned with a cap of thorns man that obviously has the identical wounds as documented in the Gospels that were uh, the way Jesus was tortured. Uh, his face is severely swollen, beaten, one cheekbone, both cheekbones swollen one more than the other, like a prize fighter that lost. Uh, so his face was severely beaten. There's uh, blood stains, not just in a circle around his head, but covering his entire scalp. There's a spear wound in the side. There are uh, nail wounds uh, from crucifixion nails that we can only we only see the back of the hand, so we only see the exit wound of those nails, also nail wounds in the feet, and the scourging. You know, if you look at artworks, uh, Christian artworks through the centuries, artists have always depicted Jesus with his back shredded by the scourging. But in reality, if you're standing behind somebody with a whip, and you take just a slight little move closer to that person while you're whipping them, some of those wounds are going to come around and they're going to hit the front of the body as well. And the man of the shrouds, not just is his back covered with scourge wounds from his neck to his ankles, but the front of the body as well, which indicates to me 
that no artist did this. This is too realistic for an artist, especially a medieval artist. And of course, our team, once we got there and examined the cloth, found no paint or pigment anywhere on that cloth, not even in enough to be visible without a microscope. So, uh, so that was sort of the the best description I can give you of the shroud. And it shows the man ventral and dorsal, front and back, head to head. And if you go to shroud.com, you can see a lot more about this in more detail, including images of the shroud itself. It was, in, in fact, I think you started shroud.com because somebody had made the mistake of believing that the image on the cloth, the shroud, was was made by da Vinci. Uh, yeah, you, uh, I, I need to tell that story, it's kind of humorous. I, uh, I had, in 1995, I finally became convinced by the science alone that this had to be authentic. Um, so that was sort of a milestone for me. That was 17 years after we examined the clock. So I didn't rush to judgment on this. And shortly thereafter, after I kind of came to the conclusion that this is probably the real thing, I got a phone call from a friend and he was the one who said, oh, you know that shroud thing you're involved with? And I said, yeah, I know that shroud thing I'm involved with. He said, well, it turns out that's just a, a, a photo made by Leonardo da Vinci. I laughed, I thought he was joking, but there is a British woman who wrote a book claiming that Leonardo da Vinci made the shroud photographically and so I was shocked and I asked him, I said, well, where did you get that information? Well, here in the US, when you're checking out at the grocery store is where all the tabloids are. And he said, well, we were checking out of the grocery store and it was on one of the tabloids. And I had this epiphany at the moment, I realized here I am sitting on every bit of the science that's been done on the shroud by our team and others. And I had full access to everything, but the public didn't have access to that. They were being fed misinformation by the media, by terrible television documentaries, by skeptics who were attacking us and attacking our work and attacking the shroud. And so it was, it was very frustrating for me, especially when they started making up stories about all of us being a bunch of religious fanatics, which of course isn't true at all. And so at that moment, while I was still on the phone with my friend, I had a manila folder on the desk and I wrote four words, consider building a website. At that moment, I believe in my life, that was when God reached down, smacked me upside the head and said, now here's the real job. It was far less about the photographs I made in 1978 and far more about the millions of people we've reached in making all this material freely and readily available, no advertising on the website, we don't use cookies. We don't use trackers. We don't monetize our video, uh, visitors. We don't count clicks. We want this information freely available to everyone, period. And so I built Shroud.com in, in part to give everyone access to what I had privileged access to at that point in time. Now, of course, everyone has access because back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, if you wanted to read the science of a peer-reviewed journal, you had to go to a research library at a university somewhere, uh, if at all. So uh, there was no easy way for the general public to know what we knew. And that's why I built the website. So that was sort of the genesis of the website. But it was a British woman who uh, proposed that strange theory, look, I'm not a historian, I'm, that's my worst subject, history. But I knew as soon as I heard what she had to say that the shroud was being shown publicly in France a hundred years before the birth of Leonardo da Vinci. So as I always like to say, he was a great artist, but he wasn't that good. <laughs> so, so I knew that this, this was flawed. And, but it's part of the popular mystique of the shroud because she published the work and she sold some books and people, some people believed it. But the evidence is the evidence and it doesn't lie. Uh, so I believe that the work we did was critical, if not just from a scientific point of view, but to give people a faith, uh, an object of, of their devotion, which uh, particularly the Catholic faith, but also other Christians as well. 
and to give them an object that that could support their beliefs. And I don't have a problem being a Jewish man involved with people have asked me, well, you're Jewish. Why are you doing this? And I said, it's a burial shroud of a Jewish man. Why shouldn't I be involved? Uh, a matter of fact, there were no Christians in Jesus's time. <laughs> so, so, uh, so a Jewish man representing the science, look, no one can accuse me of having a Christian bias. Never had one. So it gave me the opportunity to share this information, to do it in a neutral manner. I had no attachment one way or the other. So I could be neutral about my presentation of, of the science and allow people, as it said, on maybe the smartest thing I ever wrote, one sentence in the opening paragraph of Shroud.com says that we believe that given the facts, you have to make up your own mind about this. I'm not an evangelist, it's not my job to to preach to someone. I'm not a rabbi, a priest, or a minister. It's not my place to do that. My place is to give you the information and allow you to see what we know, and then you can decide for yourself, does this mean something to me or not? And if it does, fine. And if it doesn't, fine. I'm not keeping score. Yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know if you know the quote by uh, Blaise uh, Pascal. He said, like, in, in faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't so yeah. in a sense the shroud is like that there's enough evidence there to to allow you to believe and enough enough shadows i guess to give you that avenue of disbelief talking about evidence can you speak about the peer-reviewed journals some of the peer-reviewed journals that um that sure. argue for the authenticity oh, yeah yeah uh, our works were submitted to and published in journals like Applied Optics and ask any scientific researcher who's ever submitted work to Applied Optics, how difficult it is for them to accept anything. Uh, they are very high standard journal. Of course, now we have impact factors, a way of judging journals because of the proliferation of online journals that you pay them a couple of hundred dollars they'll publish it. That's not peer review, that's, that's finances. Um, but the real scientific journals actually take the time, sometimes months, to review a paper, to review the processes used by the researcher, to review the data collected, to review the conclusions drawn by the researchers to determine if they match up with the data and the techniques that were applied. That's peer review. And Sterp's work, I think all but one or two papers were all published in applied optics, uh, IEEE journals. The good news is this, if you go to shroud.com, there's a whole section on the 1978 STIRP work, the, the whole thing that we did, includes all of the STIRP published papers. So you don't have to go find those journals anymore. You can go to shroud.com and every one of our peer reviewed journal articles are listed on one page of our website. So that saves you having to go find the journals themselves. Of course, now many of those journals are on the internet, but many of them don't go back until 78, 79, or 80. They haven't archived them all the way back. Some of the journals have, but it's a major undertaking to archive that much material going back all those many years. So I th think that we have sort of filled a, a need for it by putting it onto the internet the way we have and to do it in a manner where we're not monetizing anybody, we're not trying to build a, 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 a list of names, we don't sell the list that we do have. We have about 4,500 people on our mailing list. It's a self-subscribed list. We don't put your name there. If you wanna be on the list, all you have to do is go to the page of the website, put an email address in, you don't have to put your name, address, or any other information, just an email address, and that's all you need, and you'll get our our emails, which we send generally about four per year, mainly to let people know when an update to the website has been completed. We do about four a year. It's like publishing a, a magazine every three months or so. Uh, the website is older. Mm -hmm. The website is older th than Google, right? Yeah, I get. Yeah, I, people have made a big issue about our being number one on Google, and I have to point out that we went online in January of 1996, and Google didn't come along until 1998. Hmm. So the fact that we're number one on Google, well, we're two years older than Google. So there wow. you have it. Um, who does the shroud belong to and who did it belong to? Yeah, it uh, for 
literally for about five and a half centuries, it belonged to the Savoy family, the, the monarchy family of Italy. Uh, they owned it and passed it down through the generations within their family. But in uh, 1983, upon the death of the last King Umberto II, uh, the one who approved our examination, by the way, uh, but upon his death, instead of leaving it to his son, which historically for over 500 years in the Savoy family, that was the case, he decided that that wasn't the best idea and decided to leave it not to the church, which would require, what, 130 cardinals to vote. And we know how that can be. That can be a matter of fact, I think there was a period in history where there wasn't a pope for like seven years because the cardinals couldn't decide on who to be the pope. Um, so I think the king realized maybe that's not the best solution. It should be in the hands of one person to make the decision. And he left it to the living pope. And it took two years to go through probate until 1985 when probate was completed and the legal owner of the Shroud of Turin became whoever the living Pope was. And at that moment in time, it was John Paul II. Upon his passing and the election of Benedict to replace him, he became the legal owner. When he resigned and retired and Francis took over, he became the legal owner. So it passes through the hands of the Holy See, but not the church as an institution. And I think that was wise on the part of the king. I mean, there had to be a reason why he didn't leave it to his son the way it had been done in his family for over 500 years. But whatever that reason, I think he, he felt that the best thing he could do would be to put it in the hands of someone who could make the decisions, a single person, someone qualified to take all the data and then make a decision. And the Pope's a perfect person for that. So who allowed you to examine it? Was it was so it wasn't the Catholic Church, it was actually the Savoy family or the King? Who who allowed Correct. your team to? Yeah, because you see, the king is was the legal owner at the time. And the folks in Turin were the custodians. Well, the implication of custodians, you're taking care of something for somebody else. They didn't own it, although they like to be in control of it, of course, but they were not the owners of it. And it was King Umberto that we submitted our 70 or so page test plan, which by the way, is also readily available on shroud.com. You can see what we submitted to the King, the actual document um, that he evaluated and he approved it. Now I've said this and I'm saying it publicly, I realize that, but if it had been up to the church or even the custodians in Turin, we never would have gotten permission. But because the king was the owner and he had the authority to say that we could do so, the custodians had to go along with it, but they were not happy. And, and look, in all fairness to them, they'd been studying this for a long time. All of a sudden, the king authorizes a group of Americans from big name laboratories to show up and kind of uh, usurp their position and go in and be able to have this examination when they, was ne they were never given that permission. So if there was a little resentment there, I can understand that. I mean, I'm sure that we would have felt the same way if the situation were reversed. So in all fairness, uh, the folks in Turin were not thrilled about it. Uh, one, one or two of them may still not be so thrilled about it, but it's already part of history. So it was King Umberto who authorized us and gave us permission and notified Turin that he had done so. And so they had to cooperate with us but it was very grudgingly done. They, they were not happy about it. And, and for the reason I've stated. So your team, when you, when you were going over there with your scientific team, like, like how, how much stuff did you bring? What obstacles did you face? Like, was it just, was it straight sailing or like, what was <laughs> no. the. Listen, there wasn't one day without a crisis. It, we spent 17 months de designing the experiments, fabricating some of the materials and equipment that we would need to use, including the large table, steel table, so we could fasten the entire shroud onto it with magnets at the peripheral, so we would cause no harm to the cloth. And the magnets were even coated in Teflon so that no metallic particles might be transferred to the cloth. So all the magnets were sealed in Teflon. And so we, we were given that opportunity. And uh, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, no, the, the amount of stuff that you were bringing right. over. On, so, yeah. 
so we shipped all this stuff over there. There was like 80 crates of equipment. Uh, shipped it over a month before we were to go to Turin. We had our final meeting. The first time that the group, our team met as an entire group, we had been working in regional groups. I was in the California group. There was a group here in Colorado at the time. There was a group in New Mexico where Los Alamos and Sandia Laboratories were. The California group had most of the imaging guys, Don Devan, the man I had worked with on the atomic bomb project. Uh, he was in California. Two men from the Jet Propulsion Lab, Don Lynn and John Lohr. Don Lynn was head of imaging on Voyager Viking Mariner and Galileo projects. Whoa. So he was my hero on the team. A NASA imaging scientist doesn't get much better than that for a technical photographer. Um, there was a group in New England that were our medical guys. Who were, uh, and we also had Robert Bucklin, who was the man they based the television show Quincy on. I don't know if that's made it over to Europe or not. I think it has. It was about a forensic pathologist. And Bucklin was not, not only the guy they based the character on, he was an advisor to that show. And he was on our team. So, so we, were, we had quite a, 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 an important group of people together. Um, oh. And Who funded you? Where did you get the money? Was it like yeah. National Geographic or something like that? Well, or? we we got a very small amount from National Geographic. Um, I know I received, I think it was seven hundred fifty dollars from Life Magazine, which I immediately donated to the uh, the organization to, to the Sterp organization. But we were primarily funded by a private individual who had a, a corporation called the Durancy Corporation. He was the heir to one of the brewing fortunes here in the United States. Um, and so he was very strongly in favor of the examination of the shroud <clears throat> and he paid for the shipping, he paid for the airline tickets and he paid for uh, the hotels. There were what, tw tw 24 of us, uh, imagine paying for 19 nights in a hotel for 24 people. So that that bill itself had to be pretty substantial. How about airline tickets, round trip airline tickets for 24 people? So so there was a substantial amount of money there, but the Durancy Foundation put up most of that money. We were all volunteers. No, none of us were paid. Um, actually cost me a, a good bit to do this because uh, I spent $2,500 just to buy the film and the processing necessary for the film I shot. Um, hmm. I had to bring some money with me to pay for meals because the meals weren't covered by the hotels and the airline tickets. Um, and so, and I was gone for three weeks. I had two employees and a family to support back home here in the US. Uh, everybody had to get paid. And while I was gone, we lost two projects to our competition because I wasn't there to do the photography. So I figured the, it cost me around $30,000 over that you know, period of time. Well, but you know, it wasn't about the money and no, nobody cared. Uh, but people who, who think we did this for fame and fortune, I always say, okay, name three members of the STIRP team besides me. Very few people can do that because <laughs> fame and fortune did not come. Uh, like I said, I, I was out about $30,000 at the time. I don't know what that would be in current dollars, but it was a substantial amount for me and, and my meager little business. Mm -hmm. But it was never about the money. And we didn't care about that. It was, I think that we all understood, even if it didn't reflect our personal beliefs, that we were doing something that was critically important to a billion or so people on this planet. And so we took it seriously. Look, the, these were a bunch of really serious scientists. And I've said this, and I'm working on an article right now, I'm writing about this same topic, where I said, thank God that Los Alamos National Laboratories and Sandia National Laboratory both weapons laboratories, nuclear weapons laboratories. Thank God they didn't hire a bunch of wackos to work in, on their projects or the whole planet might have blown up by now. These were the hardest, most empirical scientists I have ever worked with. Um, they taught me the meaning of empiricism. Uh, even though I'd worked in the sciences before that, I'd never worked with a group that were as meticulous and careful as these men were to do the best science possible. And I'm proud to still be around 
to be able to document that and put it on the record because skeptics continue to claim that we're a bunch of, what do they uh, say, a bunch of, uh, the, our work was the rantings of believers, which of course isn't true, mm -hmm. and that we are a bunch of pseudoscientific nutters. That's, I'm quoting now from a, pod, a recent podcast. And that's offensive to me. That is offensive because, look, if I take an instrument and I point it at a piece of cloth and I pull that trigger to take a reading, that instrument doesn't care if I'm a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, or a pagan. It doesn't matter to the instrument. It records the data that it's designed to record. That data is collected, integrated into a paper, studied, analyzed, conclusions are drawn, and all of it's published in peer-reviewed journals. So if somebody doesn't like the conclusions that our team drew, you can go to those papers, see the mechanisms and processes that we used, and try and repeat them or try and challenge them. That's fine. But what's happened is over the years, since many of these men have now died, now they're attacking the scientists. And I, the way I see it, the skeptics obviously aren't smart enough to be critical of the science. So it's much easier to just be critical of the scientists. Mm -hmm. But they don't address the scientific issues that were raised by our work. And that's where the truth lies. Can you talk about some of those scientific, uh, dis some of those uh, discoveries, those scientific? Sure. Yep. Well, first of all, our primary focus, excuse me, our primary focus was to determine what formed the image. We weren't there to try and prove it was Jesus. We weren't there to try and prove the resurrection because science can't address that question. We were simply there to determine what forms the image. Is it a painting? Is it a scorch? which was one of the other proposed theories, uh, or rubbing, or in some cases, uh, Leonardo did it photographically 500 years before the invention of photography. So the, those were the kind of the prevailing theories. So our purpose and the design of all of our testing was to basically go and determine, A, is there paint or pigment anywhere? Is there silver anywhere, silver salts that would be necessary for a light sensitive emulsion to create a photographic image? zero silver, zero paint and pigment. There is no paint or pigment responsible for the image. The fibers that are, that are responsible for the image are just yellowed a little darker than the adjacent fibers that are non-image fibers. And it's the collection of those images, the, the uh, amount of those images in any specific area that dictate how light or dark the image appears to the, to the eye. It's like a halftone in a reproduction in a magazine. If you look with a magnifier at any reproduction in a magazine, you'll see the image is made of little dots. The darker areas, the dots are larger and, and closer together. The lighter areas, the dots are smaller and further apart. And the image on the shroud, all of the image fibers are the same color. They're all a kind of a yellowish color. And it's the concentration of those in any given area that gives the impression of lights and darks, just like a similar to a half tone that we would see in a magazine. So our purpose was to go there and answer that, that question. What, is, what forms the image on the shroud? And so the testing that we performed was specifically designed to answer those questions. Spectral analysis, uh, UV uh, reflectance from fluorescence photography, infrared imaging, thermal imaging, um, X-ray fluorescence and reflectance. So all of these and the spectral data, all of these were, and, and as far as spectral analysis, because, you know, spectral analysis will tell you what's there. We had all of the spectral characteristics of every paint, pigment, and binder known to man from medieval to modern times. So we had a reference library. We could compare the results of the shroud to all the known science about what paints and pigments were, have been used over the centuries. We found none of that. So we could easily and ultimately say in the conclusion of all of our work, this is not the product of an artist because there's no art medium anywhere on this clock, except for a few particulates here and there. And they came from the 54, I believe it is, documented occasions where the, um, uh, where the Savoy family authorized an artist to come in and paint a copy of the shroud. And then they allowed him to lay his copy onto the actual shroud to make it a relic. 
and to sanctify it, if you will. So there was a few particles of pigment that would have transferred in that process, especially over 50 some occasions. When we did our analysis, we found a few particulates of pigment, but if you scraped it all together into one pile, you'd still need a microscope to see it. That's how little there was. So paints and pigments were not responsible for the image. No silver salts anywhere in that cloth. They would have permeated into the cloth based on the theory that's been proposed by the gentleman who pr promotes that theory. That cloth would have been full, filled with silver everywhere and more so in the image. We found zero silver anywhere. And that's the only light sensitive emulsion that might have been available to a brilliant medieval scholar but photography didn't get invented until 1826 or 1827. And we still have the first negative. It's in a museum in Texas, I believe. So to, the purpose of our team was to answer that one question, how's the image form? And in the end, we, we couldn't answer that question. We don't know of a mechanism that can create an image with these properties. If you get the chemistry right, the physics is wrong. If you get the physics right, the chemistry seems to be off. So. The only answer that I can give is uh, we can tell you what it's not, not a painting, not a scorch, not a rubbing, not a photograph, but we know of no mechanism that can create an image with the documented physical and chemical properties as shown on the shroud. Mm. And what about the blood, Barry, the blood that, that um, changes its composition if, if the person goes through a severe trauma? There was, there was a doubt about that the shroud was real because the blood was still red on it. Can you explain yeah, that? Yeah, that was, that, was, that was me that had that problem. Uh, and, and Vern Miller, who was the chief scientific photographer at, at, uh, on the team, uh, when they unveiled the shroud to us, Vern and I were standing next to each other and looking at it. We were looking at one of the blood stains. And now it's not a bright red, like, you know, fresh blood but it's still reddish in color and old blood generally turns brown or black even, usually even within 15 to 30 minutes sometimes, depending on temperature, atmospheric conditions, humidity, et cetera. And so that was sort of a, a, a sticking point for myself and for Vern. And it wasn't until 1995. And I was on the phone with Dr. Alan Adler, who was the blood chemist of our team and also the third Jewish guy. And I was talking to Al and he said to me in that conversation, he said, you know, Barry, and this was 1995, 17 years after we did our thing. He said, you know, Barry, I'm, I'm beginning to think this has got to be the real thing. This is from another Jewish guy based on solely the science, no emotional things. And I said, yeah, but nobody has explained the red blood. Why is the blood still red? And he got mad at me at that, but of course, Al, was very dramatic kind of a guy. And, oh, didn't you read my, you didn't read my paper. And I said, well, listen, Al, you're a blood chemist and I'm an old hippie photographer. And so I, and your paper was written 17 years ago. <laughs> and if I, if, and although I did read it, maybe I just didn't quite understand it. And he said, well, if you'll read the paper as if I hadn't, uh, he said, you would find that I found a high content of bilirubin. Bilirubin is a compound generated in the, in the body, uh, particularly under duress, torture, and things of that nature. I think it comes from the liver or pancreas or someplace. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and that bilirubin acts as a hemolytic agent and breaks down the cell walls of the red blood cells, releasing hemoglobin that stays red. Now, recent testing to try and follow that theory up did not achieve the same results that Al Adler did. So it's still a question mark. But that was enough at that moment in time in 1995. That was the threshold that I was able to cross based on what Adler told me. Whether he was 100% right or not, remember, we're talking about technology that has advanced so dramatically since then that everything back in those days that we did is museum quality. Now it's old stuff. The technology has advanced so much more. So at the time, that was enough to push me over the threshold and for me to accept the shroud was authentic. And it was that moment that that happened. And then it was just a, maybe a, a few days or a week or two later that my friend called me, as I've already told that story, about seeing it on a tabloid. And that's what prompted me to form the website. So it all kind of came together in 1995 for me. 
And so at the end of 95, I bought a book, how to write HTML code. <laughs> because in those days, if you wanted a website, you had to write code. There was no software that wrote codes for you. There were no website to build websites like we have today. And so I had to learn to write code. So I bought the book and uh, over the Christmas holiday, my son and I went up into the mountains to do some snowmobiling. And at night in the hotel, we were pretty much snowed in anyway. So I sat there, I didn't have a laptop at the time. So I had a yellow rule tablet and I was writing code to build the first page of shroud.com. We got home on January 1st of 96. I sat down at the computer and transferred it all in and started building shroud.com. And on the 21st of January, three weeks later, shroud.com went online. Wow. So, yeah, wow. it just all happened, boom. Wow, that's, that, that's incredible. Um, Barry, in 2023, Right now, what is the newest uh, data? Uh, what is the newest? Is there any new on the shroud? Has anything well, new come from it? I, uh, remembering that they have not allowed anyone else to examine the shroud in the last uh, 45 years to the, the way we did extensive non-destructive testing. Mm -hmm. They haven't permitted that. Nobody um, whatsoever? Nothing whatsoever. Wow. As far wow. as research goes uh, or access to the shroud goes. Um, when, so when we're it, all... When it, uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, when is the next public viewing? When is the, when is uh... Uh, Well, John Paul II said that the year 2025 should be a year where they publicly display the shroud because it's also the next holy year of the Catholic Church. Probably not too many Jewish people know that, <laughs> but I do. You can see who I've been hanging out with for the last 30, uh, 45 years. Anyway, um, so it's tentatively scheduled for 2025. Everybody believes that Pope Francis or whoever the Pope might be at the time would follow in his predecessor's wishes and allow that. And there was an article that came out in July of last year from Turin, from the new Archbishop of Turin, intimating that that was probably going to happen. He didn't say that it would but he didn't say that it wouldn't. He sort of implied that, uh, that they were anticipating that. Well, coming from the Archbishop of Turin, that's a pretty good source, although the decision has to be made by the Pope. So we're hopeful that, uh, and it, they usually make an announcement, use 18 months in advance, maybe at the most. So if they're gonna do it in 2025 20, and they probably do it around the Lenten season normally, um, so we're probably not gonna hear anything formally and officially, probably to, the end of this year, maybe even the beginning of next year. Once the dates are announced, then there'll be a big rush to get tours set up and uh, they have to train up at least 4,000 um, volunteers in Turin to help handle the massive crowds that come. They do a brilliant job. They have special places for people in wheelchairs. For those that are visually impaired, they have a sculpture of the 3D image of the shroud that visually impaired people can put their hands on and feel the image. So they, they do a superb job. And of course, they also have to put uh, security in place dramatically. They don't ever talk about what security is in place, but you can be sure it's, there's plenty of it because I know in 2015, we, we saw the drones, we saw the cameras, we knew that everybody was being watched. They were using facial identification software. And of course, now we have AI. So you know, uh, so their security is, but they never discuss it publicly, not even How with those of us that are sort of part of the thing. So, but we do anticipate that there will be a public exhibition in 2025. And as soon as a formal announcement is made, of course, we'll do a special update of the website to let everyone know. How do you feel now about it when, like, for example, the last time you saw it, knowing that you once were right beside it and you touched it and that it's, it's you well, actually think it's authentic? How do yeah. you feel now? Well, somebody asked me just recently, uh, if there's an exhibit in 2025, will I go there again? Will I be a part of a tour as I've done in the past? And I said, well, God willing, if I'm still alive and, and I'll be 79 years old that year and I've already stopped mu much of my traveling. Uh, and I've already seen it five different times in my life, far more than anyone on the planet, particularly the first time, five days and nights in the room with the shroud. So if my physicality doesn't allow me to go to Turin in 2025, I won't feel badly about it. I have seen it 
on more occasions than most people that are alive on this planet today. And so uh, maybe the most important thing is that I've contributed to our knowledge base on the shroud so that people going to see it for the first time with their own eyes will have a better understanding of what's there based on the work that we've accumulated and put on the website to serve as a, an educational tool and a guideline to what's on that cloth so that people of faith or people just interested and in, not necessarily from a faith point of view can find what they're looking for on our website. Mm -hmm. um, the image on the shroud, is it, of a, is it of a resurrected man or a dead man? Because if you're, if you're looking at, like, what are we looking at really when we, is it, is it like, you know, with the blood samples and are the blood stains, what are we looking at really? Well, we're looking at a man who was certainly scourged, beaten, speared, crucified, crowned with a cap of thorns, if you will, uh, which matched the gospel accounts of what was done to Jesus. Um, so one can infer from that and the accumulation of all the data. Look, I don't have a problem accepting that this is the cloth that wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth. People say, well, then you've got to become a Christian. I go, wait a minute. Those are two separate issues. A Jewish burial shroud of a Jewish man who I believe existed, as most people do. Um, and we have a documented piece of cloth that wrapped his body after his death. I don't have a problem accepting that without necessarily having to accept that he was or was not the Messiah. Now, people, I get evangelized all the time. And I would say, well, look, I'm not excluding the possibility that he was the Messiah, but I'm not a biblical scholar or a theologian, and I leave those questions to people far more knowledgeable and with more expertise than I have in these things. Just because I'm Jewish doesn't make me an expert. Um, and so I can accept that we have a relic of the historical Jesus, but most Christians will say, well, science can't explain the image, so it's obviously the product of the resurrection. So I have, uh, I have a couple of answers for people when that question comes up, which it does all the time. Uh, answer number one is a scientific answer. No one witnessed the resurrection event. No one knows the mechanism of resurrection event. And the scientific method says you cannot use one unknown mechanism of resurrection to try and prove another unknown mechanism of image formation on the shroud. So science can never answer that question because no one can define the mechanism of resurrection to address it scientifically. So the scientific answer is, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but science can't address that issue scientifically. That's answer number one. Answer number two is this. What does your heart tell you about this? What does your faith tell you about this? If you believe that this is a product of the resurrection and that's fortified your faith, why would I want to challenge that? I, you know, I can accept that uh, and say, look, that's the beauty of the shroud, because I feel that if you need science to make sure that your faith is strong, then the issue isn't the science, it's your faith. Maybe you should go back and re-examine your faith, because the whole concept of faith is to accept without evidence, without proof, isn't that what faith is? So I guess if, if someone's struggling with their faith, I know I've received countless emails over the years from people who said, you know, they heard something I said or read something I wrote and said that fortified and strengthened their faith. Well, that's just simply the unintended consequences of telling the truth. I'm, I'm not trying to evangelize anybody or tell people how or what to believe. All I'm doing is saying, here's the evidence, make up your own mind. So is it a possible product of the resurrection sure it's possible but that's not a scientific answer that's a much more theological or spiritual or religious answer and not something science can address we weren't trying to prove who it was we weren't trying to prove the resurrection and i'm not sure that there's any way science could ever prove the resurrection um, but i also think this and this is where i get myself into trouble I don't think we have enough data yet to exclude the possibility of a natural explanation for that cloth, for that image. Remember, it's had one set of tests, in-depth in set of tests, 45 years ago. 
We had the state of the art and technology 45 years ago, but today the technology is so much far further advanced that any new set of testing, similar to what we did, even repeating some of the tests that we did, but with newer technologies. And you gotta remember, we came back with all this data and created a thousand new questions on top of the one we were trying to answer. And so we had hoped to do a second set of tests on the shroud. We submitted it to uh, Cardinal Ratzinger who became Pope Benedict. He evaluated it, approved it, sent it to Pope John Paul II. And that's when politics entered the equation. And two researchers from the Pontifical Scientific Academy convinced the Pope not to let the Sturp team touch the shroud again because they would damage it. Never mind the fact that when we arrived in Turin and they brought the shroud to us, it had been thumbtacked onto a piece of wood, punching little holes around the periphery of it. And every time they took out the thumbtack, there was a little hole with rust around it because that's the way thumbtacks usually work. And so they were worried about us, but they literally crucified the shroud with thumbtacks. It had to all be removed. So the way I see it, we weren't going to cause it any harm, but politics entered into the mix, nationalism a little bit probably, uh, because these were Italian researchers who still resented the fact that we'd been given that permission 20 years earlier. And so, you know, that's sort of where it lies now that until the Pope says yes to further testing, many of these questions are going to remain unanswered. And consequently, there's a lot of beating a dead horse, if you will, of trying to get more information out of the older data. And, you know, some new techniques have come along that have allowed some new information perhaps to be found. Um, but they've not allowed another physical examination since 1978, uh, an in-depth one. So until that's allowed again, I can't say for a fact that we can exclude a natural explanation for the image. We don't have enough data to exclude that. Well, Barry, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I really enjoyed speaking to you. And thank you so much for your time uh, tonight. And I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much. and. I would encourage everybody to go on to shroud.com and look at all the work that's there. there it's, there's a mountain of work there. Thank you so much, Barry. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me on and thanks for the great questions. Thank you. Thank you.